Good morning, everyone. I'm Michael David Fox. I'm a director of the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies here at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. And I'm really delighted to that we have finally reached the day of this long awaited event on Soviet nostalgia. It's the second of three events that series has put together on the 30th anniversary of the Soviet collapse in 1991. The first was the book discussion with uh, Vladislav Zubok that happened the other day, which is a great discussion that we had will be posted on the series YouTube site um, soon. And on Monday, we have a symposium, an interdisciplinary symposium on the Soviet collapse that's happening Monday for PM. Um, if you haven't heard about it, we're going to put up a, a registration in the chat. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce Jill Doherty. She's an adjunct professor of uh, at Ceres, and she had a long and distinguished career at CNN, where she was um, White House correspondent, State House, uh, State Department correspondent, and Moscow bureau chief. So I just, all that remains is to thank Ceres and to thank the Carnegie Corporation of New York, which is sponsoring this um, Russia Brief series. Jill? Okay, well, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I'm really glad everybody is here. I, I have long awaited this too, because I think it's a fascinating subject and I'm really excited about the discussion. Uh, so I thought I'd kick it off by, um, Reminding, I'm sure a number of people in the audience have been to Moscow, and if you have, you probably have visited Old Arbat Street, you know, and if you walk down, it's now a, p a pedestrian area filled with souvenir shops and stalls, and you can't get more than, you know, 10 feet before you encounter all manner of Soviet kitsch. And I just wanted to uh, see if I can share my screen here to show you a little example, um, let's see, whoops, let me, let me just do this, hold on. This, I always love this because of course, technically it gets a little crazy. Uh, can everybody see that? I hope so. Um, this is part of the Matryoshka collection. As you see, uh, Stalin on the left, Lenin in the middle, and Brezhnev on the right. So uh, this really is kind of, um, as I said, kitsch, but it is an example of some of what we're going to talk about. So let me just get my notes up here and we will continue. So, um, you know, that is part, that is part of what we're discussing, but Soviet nostalgia, and I am not an expert on this. The two people who are going to be speaking are, but the, it is very deep and very broad and goes way beyond, you know, little Matryoshka dolls. And this month, the anniversary, 30th anniversary of the end of the Soviet Union is the perfect time to discuss this phenomenon. And we have two excellent panelists. We have Dr. Bradley Gorsky. He is assistant professor of contemporary Russian literature and culture in the Department of Slavic Languages uh, at Georgetown. He's published on uh, a number of interesting subjects, post-Soviet bestsellers, late Soviet hipsters, and medieval festivals and conservative aesthetics in today's Russia. And he also is an active critic on Russian literature, a very uh, distinguished and interesting, I think, background. And Dr. Kathleen or Kelly Smith is professor of teaching at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. She's also currently associate director of Georgetown's series, which is our home away from home at Georgetown. And she is a political scientist, has written two books on the role of memory in Russian politics. Very interesting subject. Remembering Stalin's victims, political memory and the end of the USSR and myth-making in the new Russia, politics and memory during the Yeltsin era. And also, uh, Kelly, I, I see, you know, you wrote a political and cultural history of the year 1956. <laughs> uh, fascinating year, I can see why you did it. And you're also researching currently transformation of 
Pidijelkina, the writer's town um, that started under Stalin. So really, uh, uh, here we go. No more talking. We're going to jump into it. We have an hour. Um, we're going to discuss this for about 35 to 40 minutes and then open to questions from the audience. And I'm sure there will be a lot. Uh, you can put those questions that you're now thinking about in the Q&A function. If I could just ask, I hear a little bit of background sound and I'm wondering where that is coming from. D does anybody have any idea? A um, little disturbing. I, I'm not quite sure what it is. We can continue, but I was just wondering if we can kill that sound if possible. That would be great. Okay, so off we go. Um, you know, let's start with a definition of nostalgia, because actually I pulled down my old, I hate to say 1968 copy of the Orzhigov Dictionary and looked it up and nostalgia, nostalgia is defined as longing for the motherland. Uh, which I thought was a very interesting Soviet definition. So Kelly, let's start with you. How would you define what we were talking about today? What is this nostalgia? Yeah, Jill, you start with the, the hardest questions in a way, because you're right that the, the dictionary definition of nostalgia only takes us uh, part of the way. But I like that the definition you gave started with an emotional state. So taska, right, this longing. I think that nostalgia is an emotional state. It's kind of a bittersweet longing for the past, but a past that arguably uh, never existed or kind of a shinier, uh, uncritical version of the past. And so nostalgia is really only one piece, I would say, of memory politics uh, in Russia today, um, but it captures a really important mood that has both cultural and political consequences. Mm, so the emotion, yes. Um, Bradley, what about you? What's your definition? Yeah, you know, this this uh, 1968 definition I, I really like, actually. Um, uh, Tasca Parodinia is, is actually really close to the etymological uh, uh, definition of nostalgia, which, which comes from nostos, which is homeland. So longing for the homeland was actually the original definition of it. Um, uh, and it was coined in the 18th century, actually, about, about Swiss soldiers who were stationed far away from home and, and had this sort of longing to go back home. Um, but over time, it's taken on a more temporal than a geographical definition. You know, we usually think about nostalgia as longing for the past. But in the Soviet case, those things, or in the post-Soviet case, those things actually collapse, right? Because the homeland is something that disappeared in time uh, and, and hasn't been displaced in space. Um, so in post-Soviet nostalgia, you actually do get people who are sort of longing for a homeland, but it is a homeland that is in the past, not a homeland that is geographically distant. Um, but it, it brings up this kind of uh, really fascinating aspect of, of I think, this um, uh, of this um, phenomenon. Kind of makes you think: what what would our you know sort of uh, reaction be? What would our emotional state be if if our homeland, where we grew up, where we uh, where we had our youth, where our families lived? totally disappeared from out from under us, right? I think that we would feel a sort of profound sense of displacement. And a lot of the nostalgia that we see, you know, and that we'll talk about in, in more detail today is an attempt to grapple with that displacement, an attempt to sort of find a way to articulate what is so strange about this new world that people found themselves in, how to, how to sort of make sense of it, how to make sense of family belonging, how to make sense of cultural uh, uh, embeddedness within a, a, a country that has completely disappeared, a worldview that used to structure life and is completely gone. Um, and I think that you know, all of that, both, both the sort of geographical roots of this word, but also the temporal overlay that we've had over time are really important for trying to understand what's going on in the post-Soviet space. Yeah, and you know, even before we get into kind of a lot of the aspects of this, I do want to bring up a very contemporary thing, which is shutting down of, of Memorial, the uh, human rights organization. Um, it, it's a little unclear. It's, it's actually a very broad organization, but it is being shut down. And uh, we were chatting, you know, this, um, I would say, uh, re repression of Memorial actually started quite a long time ago. Brad, I think you were talking, Bradley, about uh, 2008, at least. So, uh, Kelly, let me talk with you about this initially, because you're the person 
who you know has looked at memory, Stalin, et cetera. Why is the Russian government trying to shut down this organization, which deals its very name is you know memory? Yeah, and uh, Memorial's history goes back to 1987, uh, during the very early time of perestroika, where um, it was not Gorbachev's intention to kind of open up the Pandora's box of Soviet history. Uh, but having started Glasnost, he did make way for the start of a civil society. And Memorial has been through many ups and downs. They've evolved a lot as an organization, but they are right now, I would say, the preeminent uh, historical and human rights NGO uh, in Russia. So why close it down? They've already uh, for many years labeled Memorial a foreign agent, which restricts some of its activities. But I interpret this as an attempt by the state to monopolize the field of collective memory in the way that they're monopolizing other areas. So in other words, I don't think they're going to you know, ban people from talking about Stalin's repressions or undo the monuments that have been created to the victims, but they prefer to have official institutions, state institutions be in charge of this sector. Hmm. So, uh, and it's, but I think that's the incentive behind it. Yeah, a disturbing trend, obviously. Bradley, let me ask you, um, you know, when I started thinking about this subject, in the immediate question I had for myself would be, how could somebody be nostalgic for the USSR with its gulags and repression and the suffering that so many families went through? How could you possibly be nostalgic for that? How do you explain it? Yeah, you know, it's it's an interesting question, and I think it's some uh, a big part of the sort of Western, at least, uh, fascination with this uh, post-Soviet nostalgia. Um, but you know, a, a lot of people sort of had had their youth and and their their you know school days, first kiss, you know, like all of these things in the Soviet Union. And I think it's a very human feeling to be nostalgic for sort of those times of 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 our lives. Um, and if those times of your lives happened in a place uh, that no longer exists, you're sort of automatically nostalgic for that place. I think this is true for those of us who sort of moved away from one place. Uh, after childhood. We're nostalgic for that place, whether we liked it there or not. Um, so I think that there's a, a very human element going on here, um, where, where a lot of people who, who sort of grew up in the Soviet Union are nostalgic in that way. But there is there there is something more here. I think there's a couple of more things that are worth um, pointing out. Um, one is that there's a lot of people of my generation, I was born in the 80s, um, who were born in the, the Soviet Union, but don't really have living memory of it so much, right? They, they were very young when the Soviet Union ended. Um, but among that sort of micro generation of people, there's been this really uh, popular catchphrase on t-shirts and Facebook groups, all these sorts of things, born in the USSR or even made in the USSR. And this is this sort of defiant uh, stance kind of against the, the, the Western triumphalism at the end of the Cold War that really wanted to erase the USSR from, from the map right, and wanted to say that everything that happened there was bad. And these people who were born there are saying, no, 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 I was born there, my childhood was there, my family was there, you know, this is, this wasn't all bad. And it doesn't necessarily erase all the bad things that happened in the Soviet Union, but it is reclaiming part of that for the people who are actually uh, born there. So I think that that's, that's an important aspect of it too. Um, another thing that I think is, is, is worth bringing up, and this, this is a, a, an idea that, that comes from a, a great article on the politics of nostalgia from Olga Shevchenko and, and Maya Nadkarni. Um, I think Olga is here, actually. Um, uh, and uh, they, they talk about nostalgia as the longing for longing. So this desire for uh, something in, in the future. And the, the Soviet Union was built on this idea, right? Socialism is built on this idea that the future will be better than now, right? We are building, we have the revolution, then we build socialism, and then we build eventually to communism. And that sort of teleology, that goal in the future gets totally lost in the 90s, right? And there is no, there is no sense of the future will be better than now. And that sort of attempt to reclaim a time when you are building towards something, when you're working together towards something, I think is a really uh, important aspect of that uh, longing for longing. And there's another aspect of that longing for longing, which I think is, is kind of contradictory, but actually working in, in complement here. Uh, and and uh, um, 
that same article talks about this as well. So the late Soviet Union, a lot of people are interested in the West, right? They're interested in getting to the West. They're interested in, in jazz music. They're interested in, you know, uh, brands from the West, Levi's jeans. And they construct this sort of idea of this ideal West. And if we could only be like the West, we would have a great country. We would be, you know, in this consumer paradise. And then the 90s come, you get McDonald's on Tverskaya Street, but the West isn't that great. Capitalism kind of doesn't work that well, at least in Russia, uh, democracy also. And so you lose the, that sort of longing for that other, that space of, of paradise that is beyond the borders of the Soviet Union. Now you have open, open borders, but you can't get there. Poverty, international travel restrictions, whatever it is, but you know, you, you can't make it to this idealized West and that ideal has disappeared. So both the sort of radiant future of communism and the radiant West of the other uh, that really characterized the late Soviet era, both of those kind of structured the longing that I think people want to recapture uh, in, in this uh, restructuring of, of Soviet nostalgia. And I think that's a really important aspect of it as well. Yeah, that longing for longing is really a great phrase. You know, um, Kelly, I, I just want to read from a, a book, that, um, one of my favorites, Alexei Yurchak's Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More. And there's a quote that he has in here, um, which he says, an undeniable part of today's phenomenon of post-Soviet nostalgia, um, which he calls a complex post-Soviet construct, is the longing for the very real humane values, ethics, friendships, and creative possibilities that the reality of socialism afforded, often in spite of the state's proclaimed goals, and that were as irreducibly part of the everyday life of socialism as were the feelings of dullness and alienation. So, um, but you know, what do you think about that? Walk me through that. Do you, do you agree? Um, and how do you get words like uh, ethics, friendship, humane values, creative possibilities in the Soviet Union? Yeah, Jill, that's a wonderful book and a great quote from it. Um, here, I'll say that when I wrote my book about the year 1956, I was actually inspired by active nostalgia. That is, I had been interviewing people about Stalin's repressions and how that shaped their perception of the Soviet Union and history and so forth. And the one moment when people's eyes lit up was when they mentioned the year 1956. So I was like, wow, when I think about that, I think about the Soviet invasion of Hungary. Clearly they are thinking of something else. What is it, right? And so in exploring that year, you know, part of it, of course, had to do with youth. Uh, for many of the Gorbachev activists, that was their youth. And they remembered the excitement after Khrushchev's secret speech. Uh, and they remembered their you know, fairly orthodox standard belief in the values touted by the regime, which did include justice, equality, collective action, um, and they sought to embody those in their daily lives, in their friendship groups, in the ways that they lived um, and so forth. So I think that the Soviet Union always had this mix of high ideals, some of which were realized and some of which of course are not. So when we think about nostalgia for the Soviet Union, sometimes it is for the stated ideals, um, brotherhood of peoples that underlay the way that people in the center saw the empire, uh, equality. And sometimes it was for the lived reality, which had to do with tremendous economic stability, uh, the provision of a certain basic level of goods. There's a wonderful book by Jane Zaviska about housing in the post-Soviet period, where she talks about how the new generation does not want to buy a house with a mortgage, you know, that <laughs> want the old system where you worked hard and your hard work was recognized by the state that gave you housing. Nowadays, of course, you can work hard in Russia and the money that you make is not gonna buy you an apartment, especially in Moscow. So they do see some of the advantages of the old system, even as we look at those old, you know, Khrushchev buildings or, you know, prefab apartments and to a Western eye, they're so drab and plain and limited. Yes, they were. But if your choice is, you know, waiting to inherit a family apartment 
or getting this lesser form of housing, many people would choose the lesser form. So I think when we look at nostalgia, you know, it's generally not about the gulag. It's much more about daily living and the perception of stability, confidence. Uh, and as Bradley mentioned, with that, a certain level of utopia that you thought that society was making progress and that life would get better and happier and richer, maybe not reach the West, but be on an upward trajectory. And I think that's really lost nowadays. Uh, the contemporary Russians don't have a sense of uh, a positive trajectory. They have a constant state of anxiety instead. If I could just jump jump in here, because sure. uh, I, I really think this this uh, point that Kathleen made about um, uh, economic stability is is I think really important. Um, in in the the first time that I got over to Russia was two thousand five. Um, and everybody I knew there who was in um, in the just generally defined intelligentsia was working four or five jobs. Everybody who teaches at a university is teaching at two or three different places um, and then tutoring in the evenings. Anybody who is an editor uh, or a writer for a journal um, is getting paid pittances if, if they're getting paid at all. Oftentimes the sort of wages are withheld. Um, and in contrast, you know, the people who are uh, in, who were in those positions in the Soviet Union those positions were respected, they were paid, and they came often with, with housing. Um, and so there was this perhaps I, over idealization of, of late Soviet intellectual life, but it had little to do with um, uh, sort of interaction with um, official state institutions. It had more to do with exactly what your Chuck is talking about in this, in this quote that you mentioned, the ability to sort of have some sort of free time. A lot of people, uh, a lot of the intelligentsia in the in the uh, 90s and early 2000s would talk about how free time has totally disappeared, right? Uh, and there is just no ability to sort of have uh, any time to pursue creative activities outside of work um, or even just friendships, you know? And so this, this uh, what, what your checks has humane values, ethics, friendships, and creative possibilities, all of those were sort of afforded by this relative economic stability, which was at near poverty levels at some times, but it was sort of stable and didn't have the, the scramble uh, aspect of, of, of post-Soviet existence um, uh, for, for a lot of these, these people. So I think that that's, that's a big aspect of what he's talking about here. It's not necessarily um, always just the, the state ideals, um, although that does come into it, but it's also the affordances allowed by, by this stability. Yeah. When would you say, um, I guess Kelly will go to you, when, when would you say this post-Soviet nostalgia began? And I'm not, you know, we all know 1991, the Soviet Union ends, but I remember uh, early on um, buying, I'm embarrassed to say, as a typical American, I bought a hammer and sickle like vest and skirt and I wore it around, it was black and red, very shocking. But I do remember that, I wish I still had it. It would be probably a collector's item. But in any case, you know, the, the, did it, did it um, was it a, a feature of life in Russia post-Soviet immediately or has it picked up speed? Is it different now? What's the evolution? Yeah, so I think there's two things to think about in, in that very interesting question. The first is this maybe more uh, general or political nostalgia that affected how people voted, uh, what sort of campaign promises they wanted from politicians. And I think that really was present from the very beginning because, you know, there was no vote about ending the Soviet Union. And in fact, Putin likes to point out that when they had that referendum back in March of 1991 about, do you want a renewed union? You know, the majority of people said yes, right? So, so I think that, that a certain level of political discontent with the changes was present from the beginning. But I think what you're tapping into, Jill, is more of the cultural side, right? Like when did this sort of retro Soviet chic become cool and how far, you know, can you stretch that? And I'll say that to me, I think I really started to notice this more in the early 2000s. And I'm thinking here of um, you know, the restaurant scene in Moscow, that suddenly it became kind of cool to have uh, restaurants that, you know, channeled either sort of the high Stalinist luxury or currently 
um, at Veden Ha, which in and of itself is a nostalgic object. This is this uh, big exhibit of achievements of the national economy. Um, you know, they have a, a fancy restaurant called The Thaw. So if you want to be nostalgic for The Thaw, you can go there and eat, you know, in the food and sort of design atmosphere of the time. So I think that that uh, sort of commercialized nostalgia is a little bit newer. Um, I do wonder sometimes who it's aimed at in terms of generations, uh, you know, who, who really longs for that. Um, but certainly nostalgic cultural uh, items are very popular in film and literature. And I'm sure Bradley could talk about this more than I could, but you know, the movie um, Stilyagi comes to mind. So Stilyagi was kind of an insulting term used for young people in the 60s who copied Western fashions. Um, but uh, the movie version of it is sort of like West Side Story, you know, meets Soviet Union. It's, it's, it's a bit bizarre in its aesthetics. But again, it's harking back to this idea of, uh, I would say, an attractive, you know, style of uh, dress, of music, a sense of fun and youthfulness. Um, doesn't mean that people want to go back to being persecuted for wearing blue jeans, right? But uh, it does reflect, I think, a sense of loss uh, and a desire to reclaim some of that aesthetic uh, history for the present. Could I add a footnote sure. here, Jill? Do you mind? Oh, sure, Michael. Yeah, yeah. so because I was listening to Kelly speaking about restaurants and, you know, there's been so much interest in the former East Germany in Ostalgie, you know, the nostalgia for East Germany. And a lot of it focuses on the material culture or the objects that people knew. And when, you know, these um, cafeterias or stalovas open up in Moscow that are just like the Soviet ones, right? But the food is much better. There are no lines. It's clean. So I wonder how much of this kind of commercialized, you know, nostalgia actually promotes for younger people kind of, you know, a sanitized version. And, you know, the point that Bradley was making about the economic dimension. You were talking about the leisure time in the where no one had to work that hard in the late Soviet Union. That's true, but they had to wait in long lines. There were many difficulties. They had to go to all the party meetings. So some of that stuff is also um, forgotten. And the one point that I'd interject here is, you know, um, great power nostalgia, right? Because the Soviet Union was a superpower and that's the way so much of the political um, culture of Russia is going, right? That's There's a Stalin nostalgia, which could arguably not mean that you don't want Stalin to come back, but you want a great leader, a great power, right? And so I think that we have to think about that political uh, dimension too. Bradley, maybe you want to jump in there? Yeah, uh, I mean, so absolutely. I think I think the political dimension is 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 uh, very important here. Um, obviously, the the return to the Soviet Union is a return to one of the two superpowers that sort of structured the post war twentieth century, um, and that has a lot to do with sort of uh, sense of sense of self worth and a sense of um, of importance on on a global stage uh, for for a lot of Russians. Um, there, there is definitely a lot of that uh, happening here, but I think it's it's worth considering both uh, this sanitized version that I think Michael brings up absolutely correctly, um, and and the cultural um, nostalgia uh, aspects that that Kelly started to point out here as well. Um, a lot of these uh, cultural products about nostalgia, um, including Stiliagi, that this this film marketed as hipsters in in the West. Um, uh, uh, is a very constructed nostalgia. So the that is a musical. People break into song all the time. But not only that, they break into song from the late Soviet era. They break into 1987 uh, rock music songs that are set in 1956 or 1958 uh, in in the film. Uh, and then at the very end of the film, spoiler alert: the uh, the the characters. Uh, who are you know 1956 hipsters join with 1980s punks and uh, later uh, sort of uh, instantiations of the subculture and all walk down contemporary Tverskaya 
towards the Kremlin uh, in, a, in a joyful song. So the sort of constructedness of that nostalgia and, and the way that it's blending different eras is really sort of being worn on the sleeve there as well. Um, and th there's a lot of that going on. Uh, there's also a film called, uh, which is less successful in a lot of ways, um, but called Park of the Soviet Period, uh, uh, which sounds a lot more like Jurassic Park in Russian, Park Sovietskova Periuda, um, uh, that, that came out in 2006. And so this is an, an actual theme park is the premise of the movie that takes you back to the Soviet era. Um, and this is a lot of, of what the sort of restaurants that Michael is mentioning are doing, right? They're, they're this theme park sort of in, in real life. And this reconstruction of the material culture and this sort of ideal of the Soviet Union um, with, uh, without the long lines, without all the negative consequences, I think is a lot of what, what fuels this post-Soviet nostalgia. And it also is what fuels a lot of the political aspects. It's not a return to exactly what was happening then, but it is a, a selective choice uh, and an idealized version of the past that, that some want to return to. You know, I want to inject a uh, serious note here. Um, and maybe this will be the last question and then our audience um, can ask some questions too. But I'm thinking um, in that, I believe it was in the Yeltsin period, I kind of encountered the concept of um, Pakayanya, you know, um, which was this concept of um, coming to terms, you know, with the past, atonement for the past, and Kelly, uh, it, it really does beg that question, especially if you compare Russia to Germany. Has modern Russia really come to terms with what went on during that Soviet period? And uh, if not, why not? If so, you know, maybe partially. What what's the result? Wow, Jill, we have what, five minutes left? I think this dissertation topic. Yeah. <laughs> Talk fast. Talk fast. I'll see what I can do. Um, so I think that uh, the short answer is no. Uh, modern Russians have not come to terms with the past, but I think that that's true really of all cultures that we're constantly kind of reconfronting and having to come to terms with different aspects of our past. You can think of the US the responses to the 1619 project, for instance. So in Russia too, there are so many layers of hidden past that are you know, opened or reopened or brought to the surface that it is a constant uh, process. Um, but that said, I think that the current uh, political regime in Russia has a preferred version of the past. And to the extent that they consistently, loudly promote that version, they are in fact blocking other processes of coming to terms with the past. So we just brought up in our discussion, this kind of nostalgia for a strong state. That is a huge part of contemporary memory politics, both in how World War II remains at the center, uh, but also a pushback against uh, what I've seen referred to as apology politics. And so the idea is, is that the West is somehow pushing uh, an excessive need to apologize and repent uh, on the post-Soviet peoples and that the correct patriotic response is to resist that and instead to promote a history that has more positive angles. And I'll stop by saying it's no accident, right, that the Russian vaccine for COVID is called Sputnik after the first satellite, right? They're constantly looking for those references and putting them forward. And I certainly agree that we should recognize the past as complicated and having you know, good and bad. Uh, but when the state is so intensely engaged in historical politics, I think it does shut out the possibility for a more organic process of remembrance or repentance. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm gonna read a couple of, um, actually the first two are more in comments, good comments, and then a question. And we can always go back to our discussion. Michael, also feel free to jump in. So this is from uh, Olga Mirson, who says, the changes in meaning for nostalgia, it seems, entails the need to define homeland. For example, what Brodsky said, what is Russian about us is our Russian language, applies here too. 
Um, either do, you know, Kelly or Bradley, do you want to uh, comment on that or any thoughts that elicits? Yeah, I mean, this is this is a really interesting, but I think a, a slightly different question about about nostalgia, which is what what did nostalgia look like uh, for the emigre community, right? Um, and and this is a, a largely um, you know a pre. Uh, 1991 phenomenon. I don't know exactly when this quote from Brodsky comes from. Uh, could have come from his his few years after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, but uh, when when you do leave your homeland, but you sort of feel uh, yourself or your community as the sort of inheritors of the culture that was also expelled from that homeland, like a lot of the earlier emigres did. Um, right, Nabokov's whole sort of career is, is premised on nostalgia, deep nostalgia for not only a homeland that he had to leave, but a homeland that was also sort of lost to history. Um, so I think that that, um, that gets to some of the similar aspects, but I think it's a, it's a slightly different situation here because most of the folks we're talking about with Soviet nostalgia are in the geographical successor state, right? To, 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 uh, to the Soviet Union, they haven't sort of uh, exported their sense of Russianness and Russian language and the Russian heritage abroad in the way that Brodsky and, and, and other emigres had done. Mm -hmm. um, I'll read one other comment also by uh, Olga Mirson. Two groups were opponents, Pamit, which is one organization, and then Memorial, which we've just talked about. Since their names mean the same memory, uh, their battle is actually about what we should remember or rather in the case of Memorial, should not forget. And well said, Olga, I think. Uh, anything, uh, Kelly, that you wanted to add to that? It is, it, it, these things are very, I don't know, we need Freud to help us out here on some of this, I think, but. Yeah, um, yes, it, it is uh, important not to confuse those two groups. So Pamyat, which literally means memory, was a very uh, sort of anti-Semitic Russian nationalist group that was prominent in the early years of Perestroika and Memorial, which refers more to the concept of building a memorial, um, I think had more to do with uh, uncovering the past and kind of reversing the values. That is to say, we need to change the labels and realize that these were innocent victims of state repressions and not think of them as enemies of the people. So there's a whole linguistic element there. And it still pertains to the fights today because the fact that, you know, Memorial has to mark itself uh, on every web page, every book it publishes, every forum it hosts as a foreign agent, in many ways, as if you're still bearing that old mark uh, of enemy of the people. And in fact, the current director of Memorial, who was in court just this last week defending Memorial, she put into evidence her business card, which is labeled with the fact that the Memorial has been declared a foreign agent. And she asked the judge, she said, you know, people recognize me on the street. You know, I'm a well-known person and they ask me about things. She's like, do you want me to start wearing on my clothing a note that says, you know, I'm a foreign agent? So uh, this question of labels, of what it's safe to say and what should be forgotten is just incredibly alive uh, and sadly hugely contested right now in Russia. Yes, definitely. There's a, a comment and a question musing by Jennifer Long. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, thank you for a wonderful, thoughtful discussion. I wonder if this nostalgia is also linked to the USSR having been one of the two superpowers, and before that, the Russian Empire. I often see this working in conjunction with the very individual level economic concerns, longing for longing, working toward utopia, et cetera, that you have addressed in great detail. Uh, Bradley, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, you know, I think I, I really like the way that, that Jennifer framed this question uh, because, you know, she she also mentions and before that the Russian Empire, um, and and this uh, uh, the invocation of great power status uh, by especially the the Putin administration um, has been very. Uh, um, pastiche oriented, sort of taking taking what it wants from the Soviet Union, but also taking what it wants from the Russian Empire. So a lot of the the uh, state insignia, right, are, are imperial uh, um, uh, callbacks, um, but some are also Soviet. So you have the, the reinstate, reinstatement of the Soviet um, 
uh, national anthem right alongside the two-headed eagle and, and the, the uh, Russian Empire's flag. Right. You also have um, uh, a lot of callbacks to, you know, the, the, the Soviet, the fall of the Soviet Union being a, a, one of the major geopolitical catastrophes of the 20th century, right alongside um, uh, uh, Putin putting up a huge, just enormous statue of St. Vladimir uh, right between uh, the, the Kremlin and the Lenin Library, um, which is not something, obviously, that the Soviet Union would have endorsed. Um, so this this idea of callback to great power status uh, has a lot to do with the Soviet Union, but it is not exclusively or uh, certainly not limited to the Soviet Union. It's it's sort of borrowing um, all sorts of, um, um, you know, signifiers that could be taken from any historical era that could be used to bolster uh, contemporary claims to great power status. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, here's another question. This is from um, Marina Samkharadze. One of the bases, I would say, the main one of Soviet nostalgia currently is stability in conditions of life such as free healthcare, free education, no wars, at least within the country for Russians. It is also about greatness of their country, which we just discussed. The large part of society was far from politics and social activism, et cetera. Um, would, would you, you know, uh, um, I guess, ag agree with that, uh, either of you at this point? Kelly, maybe we'll go with you. Uh, I'll, jump, I'll jump in on that one. Um, I, think that, uh, I think that that's a wonderful observation, and I do agree. Again, I think that people's nostalgia is more based on uh, sort of daily life and, you know, memories or family stories about, say, the Brezhnev era than it is in thinking about, you know, the gulags or some historical event. Uh, but here, too, I think there is perhaps an organic process and also a state process. So there's wonderful work by the Russian scholar Olga Malinova about uh, memory of the 90s. And she really documents how uh, Putin has created or jumped on this very clear bifurcation between the 90s, which were all about, you know, lack of order, mafia, economic instability, uh, uh, lawlessness, et cetera. And then the 2000s, which were a deliberate attempt to build back a stronger state, to have stability, and to present Russians politically with uh, that choice that like now you have a leadership that prioritizes stability uh, and you can see these concrete results. So when people in Russia talk about the 90s, it's almost often with that built-in signifier that 90s equals bad, you know, and after that equals better. Uh, as someone who visited Russia in the 1990s, I have my own nostalgia for the 1990s because finally it wasn't so hard to get visa, you could travel, uh, people were not self-censoring, they would talk about anything. But that kind of memory, I think, is very rare. I think it's much more uh, an acceptance of this division and the virtuous stability. And Putin at Valdai, like a few weeks ago, was again saying, like, you know, stability is sort of the gift that we can bring to the people. I just had a small footnote there that, you know, Kelly's excellent comment points to the fact that a lot of this nostalgia is a nostalgia not for the entire Soviet period, but for a specific late Soviet Brezhnev period when they finally attained a degree of stability after half a century of upheavals um, and material prosperity and the social safety net, which was written in in the early Soviet years, but they never had the resources to actually enact it until really um, Brezhnev's period. So, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that Bradley was talking about, about the leisure, and you're talking about your child, that's also specifically late Soviet. I mean, in the early Soviet universities, they had self mistitostra in the 30s, right? People had multiple jobs just the same way. So this is really a specific late Soviet moment. Yeah, and and to that point, uh, which which I think is is really important, um, if if you look at the Soviet or sorry the the uh, Russian state's uh, response to um, the centenary of the Russian Revolution in two thousand seventeen, uh, the uh, the ways that that moment was painted uh, in in retrospect are very negative. Um, so there's a, a couple of uh, uh, TV shows that came out at the time. 
um, one called Trotsky, uh, one called Dimon Revoluzzi, Demon of the Revolution. Um, and both of these are portrayed the revolutionaries as greedy westernizers who are bent on sort of up uh, overturning the, the stability of the czarist regime, um, the, the sort of immediate post-revolutionary period, which of course throughout the Soviet Union was held up as, as a time of great revolutionary enthusiasm, is now seen as something that is disturbing, disruptive, destabilizing, um, and does not, absolutely does not feature into any sort of state nostalgia for, for the Soviet era. So I think Michael's point is absolutely right. It's, it's really this late Soviet stability uh, that is looked back on. Uh, there's a question from James Gonzalez uh, about a subject we really haven't gotten into uh, that much. Do different views on nostalgia exist in the post-Soviet periphery? What are the nuances of the feeling felt in Russia and the other uh, former Soviet states? What about uh, between ethnic Russians and non-Russians within Russia? Good, interesting question. Uh, who, I'm actually not quite sure who would want to answer that, but I'll, yeah, I'll jump in anything. there. Yeah, All I'll right. jump in there for a moment, just saying that that's another dissertation topic, I think. So we, we will <laughs> touch on this a little bit. Um, you know, there's a wonderful uh, article by an anthropologist uh, from Miami of Ohio who wrote about uh, the popularity of Soviet sausages in Lithuania. And she thought, why would people in Lithuania want to buy a food that's called Soviet? I mean, they're so... European now and they're nationalist and so forth. Um, but there too, it was a sense of this kind of very particularized nostalgia. Uh, and, you know, she argues that it wasn't just about, you know, say food being cheap, but it had to do with the sense that we think Soviet food, you know, they didn't have all these weird Western additives and so forth. It was probably better for you. Now I've eaten some Soviet sausages. I don't know if I buy that argument that they were better for you. I don't know what was in there, you know, sawdust, you know, breadcrumb, something, right? But again, it is a way to kind of distinguish yourself from competing systems. So Lithuania at the periphery uh, may feel kind of um, not quite fully part of Europe. Uh, and that is combined with their delight at being not part of the Soviet Union, but they still have that Soviet, you know, childhood dragging after them as well, right? If you're if you're a person of a certain age in Lithuania. So I think that there is uh, nostalgia, but um, you know, the questioner is quite right to say that it is filtered through local circumstances and what are their issues. And obviously the issues in Lithuania are gonna be different than the issues in Kyrgyzstan where maybe what they miss is having a state that was really good at electricity and water. I mean, you know, different problems uh, for different areas. Now we're, we're getting quite a few questions here and we only have an hour, so we'll try to go through these, but um, hi, Professor Smith. This is from Janelle Clausen. Uh, happy Thursday. It's been mentioned that the current political regime has a preferred version of the past and consistently promoted for their purposes. Is it possible that the state may eventually move past this in a post-Putin era? How deeply institutionalized, ingrained, in this, is this nostalgia factor? Well, hi, Janelle. Uh, that is a really good question. Um, and while it's always dangerous uh, for political scientists to prognose the future, I will say that I think memory culture in Russia is complicated and there are lots of alternatives. There are other moments, actors, moods in history, you know, that one can grapple with with and, and promote. I think that, you know, certainly the idea of being a great power of that kind of statehood is probably always going to be an important part of Russian memory culture. Um, but certainly there's other values that one could tout, whether that's, you know, being a multinational state or, uh, you know, experimenting with, um, you know, different kinds of, of economic systems or collective action. I mean, for sure, there's, there's things that they can look for in their past. I will say that sadly for Russia, if, you know, if what you want is sort of a liberal democracy, there the pickings are a little slim. And I always tell my students this anecdote that uh, during perestroika, Alexander Yakovlev, sort of Gorbachev's theorist of perestroika, visited uh, Berkeley where I was a student and we could ask him questions. And so I asked him, you know, did he think that there was a usable past for Russia? What could Russia do to support Gorbachev's ideas? Uh, 
And his answer was to look back to the months between the February and the October revolution. And I remember at the time being profoundly depressed because if your basis for a usable past is like months that you can count, you know, on your, on your fingers, that's not a big history, right? You have to, you have to find more than that. And sure enough, one could talk about Novgorod and assemblies and so forth. But, you know, I think that for Yeltsin, if he had wanted to really bolster democracy, he would have had to work harder on building up uh, this kind of alternative past. Um, and that didn't happen in part because he thought that's what totalitarian states do, you know, that they use propaganda. And I, I don't want to do that. So he left this vacuum where Soviet nostalgia, you know, poured in to an extent. There's a question here from uh, Alison Hilton about utopia. Utopia is a big part of this discussion, tricky idea. Back in 1979, the blockbuster exhibition of early Soviet art, Great Utopia, was also shown in Moscow at the uh, Tretikov. But curators, critics, directors, and others warned that Utopia was a misleading title because the word originally meant a fictitious ideal society. Any thoughts? Tricky question. <laughs> Thanks all. Uh, Bradley, I think this is meant for you. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a great question. Um, and I, I love the way that it's framed here. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Utopia is, is of course, a fictitious society. Not only Thomas More's uh, original utopia uh, is, is something that he dreamed up, but the, the word itself means no place, right? Um, and so I think that it's, it's kind of built into the idea of utopia that it is something that we cannot reach. It is a model, it is a, an aspiration, it is a hope, it is a telos sort of at the end of the line. But what we are sort of, how, how utopia affects us uh, now is both the, uh, the subject of that uh, art exhibit, right? right? What, what, what are the sort of types of art, the types of culture, the forms of aesthetics that are produced when people hope for a, 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 a utopia? And what does that look like in 1979 when that utopia is diminished, when that utopia looks receding farther and farther into the future than it did when that art was created? Um, so I think that, you know, even, even the, the, the original art exhibit that this really great question is premised on has that vision of a receding and ever impossible utopia built in. And I think that's part of this sort of longing for longing, part of the, the try to recover of, of that idea of utopia, not utopia itself, but the idea of utopia in the distant future. Yeah. And you're leading, I'm gonna, oh, sorry. Uh, Please, I wanted to ahead, just jump in there for a second um, and uh, say that I think there's also these sort of smaller domestic utopias uh, that are part of the fixation now and nostalgia for the past. And I think it's no accident that the big blockbuster exhibit right now uh, in Moscow are the paintings of Yuri Pimenov, uh, who famously did uh, this set of uh, oils about um, the construction of the new regions of Moscow. You may have seen his famous picture, Wedding on Tomorrow Street, where you have a bride and groom sort of tiptoeing over these large construction pipes through the mud and behind them, you know, they're building uh, those sort of, uh, you know, Khrushchev style uh, prefab housing. That to me is a retro image that is not surprisingly popular in Moscow right at this minute. So it's not the abstract avant-garde big dreams utopia. I think it's a more smaller social promises uh, ideal. Mm. You know, there, there are some great comments, actually, by people who obviously understand this subject, and I, I can't get through all of them, but there's kind of a theme. I'm looking at a, a, a comment and question from Lyudmila Fyodorova, and she says, um, uh, Svetlana Boim, who I think has been mentioned by Bradley, makes a distinction between restorative and reflective nostalgia. And while for reflective nostalgia, irony is possible, for restorative, it is not. I have to think about this deeply. Do you see any ironic aspect in the current nostalgia? Bradley, I'm going to throw that to you. Yeah, sure. Um, I, you know, I think uh, in in both Boehm's analysis and and how it is really happening, um, both of these sort of exist simultaneously. There's not not a uh, only restorative nostalgia happening at one moment and only reflective at another moment. So there's absolutely moments of, of uh, ironic nostalgia. Um, I think that comes up in a lot of these um, uh, 
uh, films that, that sort of expose their constructive nature. I mean, Stiliagi is, is very much an ironic film, even if it's taking itself uh, somewhat seriously and it's nostalgia at the same time. It, it knows that it's constructing it and there's a distance between the constructed past and, and the viewer uh, itself. Um, and this is actually kind of an interesting thing. So the, the director of Stiliagi is this guy called Valery Todorovsky, who uh, met with Matthew Wiener, the director of Mad Men. Um, and and they, they kind of struck up a friendship. And Mad Men is sort of famously scrupulous about making sure that, you know, even the apples in the grocery store that they, that they shop in are apples that would have come from the time. There is supposed to be sort of no chink in the fabric of the 1960s that Matthew Wiener uh, creates there. And Todorovsky, even though they've been sort of mutually inspired by each other, has, has taken a different path. Um, he is actually open to this, this sort of ironic nostalgia that, that I think uh, Boehm is talking about here. And a lot of the films and, and TV shows, he's also got one called The Thaw, uh, which is a TV show, sort of expose this um, constructedness of the past. And, and, and part of the pleasure of watching it is watching how this past doesn't actually coincide with the real past, the lived experience, but idealizes it. Um, so you absolutely see that, I think, throughout. Um, but there is plenty of, uh, of, of less ironic to self-serious uh, restorative nostalgia going on at the same time. So I don't think it's necessarily a one or the other, but both, both are present. I think the question of irony is so interesting because it pervades so much of the political culture right now in Russia or in the media, for example, everyone seems to know that it's not like the literal truth that we're talking about, but everyone accepts an irony and a lot of the references to Soviet past in the media are also kind of quasi ironic. And yet, how do you square that with the um, longing for longing, right? And the utopianism and the element, like even Pimenov, who was, you know, mentioned by Kelly, the painter that's it's a la mode right now, right? Before he captured the in, um, optimism of the thaw, he was a socialist realist painter. So it's a kind of longing for the enthusiasm that people know cannot really be restored. So. The irony there is, uh, is the, the element of irony may not always be there, but it's sort of an important part of the mix, it seems. Yeah. Kelly, I think we're going to give you the last word. We're getting close to the top. And uh, maybe, I don't know if you want to pick up on the irony, which I do think is very deep. Yeah, um, I guess I will just say that uh, I think one way uh, for people to cope with you know difficult situations and this i think understanding that while one can look back and admire certain parts of the past it's not really accessible you can't go back in time you're not going to be a child again you're not going to you know have those uh those experiences again right but so one way to deal especially with disappointment is to use humor and irony so to take an ironic view of the past uh is certainly attractive and perhaps helps make life livable. Um, and just to connect with Bohem, I would say then the opposite of that, right? The sort of reflective and maybe ironic nostalgia uh, has more to do with uh, reenactors. And maybe that'll be a subject for another day because I know Bradley has written a lot about that. But I would just say that to me, one of the, the most fascinating and odd memory trends is that now for World War two anniversaries that you dressed your small child up in a World War II costume, right? As if it was like Halloween, but you, that's what you do. Why do you do that? You do that in a way to make real a connection that's getting more tenuous, right? These children won't know World War II veterans, but they want to preserve that link. But are these displays also commercial, maybe ironic? It's something that we could investigate more. So. Mm. And there is, of course, uh, kind of a postmodern, very modern irony, um, which seeps into propaganda and media, which is very new and and cut this kind of cutting thing. But that you're right. There's another subject. And I'm sure the students who are on this will probably all want to begin to write their dissertations on these various subjects that have come out. It's a fascinating discussion. I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, Dr. Bradley Gorski, thank you very much, Dr. Kathleen Kelly-Smith, and Michael David Fox. And I, I just wanted to, to say one thing, you know, um, the 
this idea of ironing or duality that I think I have always sensed when I went to Russia and have spent a fair amount of time there, actually going back to 1969 and going back to 1969, I, I can hold in my memory the conversations with my friends who were living in very difficult circumstances and a, a very depressing life that they had. And yet, there was a certain intimacy, human intimacy, that you can even find um, standing in line, you know, it, for products. There was a certain, you know, social um, communication that took place waiting to buy, you know, your sasiski or whatever, which is not to idealize it, but there were two things going on at the same time, repression and horror, and then also intimacy and communication with other people, which is much harder to find in beautiful Moscow of today. So thank you very much for a fantastic discussion. And I hope you'll come back for all of the 30th anniversary uh, events that are coming up that Michael mentioned.